State of the Sun Devils with Jeremy Schnell, Jesse Morrison, and Mitch Vereldis, an Arizona sports podcast. Hello and welcome into another edition of State of the Sun Devils alongside Jesse Morrison and Mitch Vereldis. I'm Jeremy Schnell. A little new setup here, guys. We got the we got little TV. We got a nice little TV back here with the beautiful State of the Sun Devils logo in the middle of listening audience is Jayden. missing out right now. Well, yes, of course. And if you feel like you're missing out, please head over to the YouTube channel of Arizona Sports where you can wait, Jesse. Say Get hi. the YouTube yeah. plug out of the way early, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Frankie Collins, Jaden Rashada, thanks for uh, blessing you, uh, blessing us with your presence here today. Um, they're not in studio, just just to let you know. They're just oh, well, on the and, television. I mean, if you if you want to go check that out, you can go look on the YouTube channel. Yeah, believe us or not. And, if, what's it going to be? But hey, in, anytime they want to come on, look, you know, they can. As long as it's okay with Doug Tamaro. Um, oh, sure, <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, so let's just talk about some of the departures real quick, guys. I, I know we have some excitingness happening with volleyball and some of the recruits that are coming into football. Yeah. But let's start with uh, Jordan Clark. He was a great Sun Devil for the time that he was here at ASU. But now he's off to Notre Dame, Jesse. Yeah, he is going to be a Golden Domer, as they say. Is that what they call it? Yeah, they sh- they shut the uh, somebody says they that. shut the domers down. Is what uh, Herm said back in the day when uh, they the uh, Notre Dame had to be paused from uh, practicing or game or whatever happened during COVID. He said hmm. they they shut the domers down. So uh, yes, Herm spitting that- knowledge about what you can't do during COVID. That's crazy. Anyway, continue. Yes, I was told that. Um, they are called the Golden Domers by a Notre Dame fan. Oh, that's interesting. Friend of mine. I, I had no idea until just now, this, this second. So that. But yeah, um, I, I actually it. was surprised that Jordan Clark left ASU. He just always seemed like a guy that I was like, oh, he's gonna transfer this year, and then he didn't. And then he would always come back to Tempe, and it just seemed like it was his school. He loved being here, I guess. But you know, it's gonna be his sixth season of college football next year yeah so you know he's done his time at asu i can't i couldn't do six years of college guys i'm happy i barely I, made it through I, four. I, I, yeah exactly <laughs> I, I, <laughs> so like uh, i know football probably takes up a lot of your time and uh you're probably having a lot of fun doing it yeah but i couldn't do six years of college <laughs> yeah um so i mean props to him though like yeah but uh, it, and hopefully he's able to compete for a, like a big time bowl game next year with notre dame yeah that that would be great for him um again like i don't want people to get mad at players that have done their n- their normal time at a school for transferring like mm-hmm. when remy martin transferred from about to say arizona that. state he had played his four years at ASU, which was his commitment to the team when he committed. Um, He got an extra year due to COVID and went and played for Kansas. And he won a national championship, which is awesome. And so that's how I feel about all of these players with this COVID extra year of eligibility. If they leave and go play somewhere else uh, in that added year, that is perfectly fine with me. Um, And I don't think anybody should get mad at that. I mean, generally speaking, yeah, I think we were all in some sort of a shock when we saw the news. And let's let's not forget, it was preceded by Jalen Conyers' intention to transfer and him searching for a new home for his final season as well. The the fact that Jordan Clark chose to leave doesn't necessarily speak on Jordan Clark, in my opinion. Like, he shouldn't be, as Jesse said, this should not be a chastism. Of Jordan none of, Clark, none we, of the transfers should exactly. be really, but especially the the guys that have done four or five years at the school, like fully committed to this program, yes. to this university. Yes, and again, Kenny Dillingham has had nothing but glowing things to say about a grand majority of these players. So much so that apparently, according to Ryan Clark, who's the father of Jordan Clark, if you did not know went out of his way to contact Marcus Freeman and let him know how great of a person Jordan Clark is. Actually, I think we have that cut. Let's play that right now. I want to give this shout out to Kenny, Kenny Dillingham um, on this show. He actually you know, found out Jordan was at Notre Dame while we were there, and he called Marcus Freeman and asked, was Jordan Clark there? When Marcus Freeman answered, yes, you know, Jordan is here on a visit, he raved about Jordan, man, for five to ten minutes about what he was as a leader, 
how much he worked, how much everyone there at Arizona State loved him. And so to any young kid who Kenny Dillingham walks in your home and tells you that he's going to take care of you, he's going to care about you far beyond what you could do for Arizona State, that's a true testament to what that man is saying to you when he's sitting in your home. Jordan Clark can no longer do something or do things for Kenny Dillingham, but he took his time out to say kind words about him to another head coach who he'll be competing with for other opportunities. And I just wanted to say thank you to Coach Dillingham, thank you to Arizona State, and we are really excited to be a part of the Notre Dame Fighting Irish family. Just absolutely glowing review in terms of this is almost like the best recruiting pitch he could have gotten was my immediate takeaway. Like Kenny Dillingham as a recruiter. Yeah, my thing with Kenny Dillingham here is like he can now use this as a recruiting tool. Say like, hey man, if it doesn't work out for you here, um, as long as you, you know, show up to work every day and are a guy that people respect, I'm gonna give you glowing reviews to whichever coach program you want to go to in the transfer portal. Um, And then, you know, if you're good enough to go to the NFL, I'm sure he will vouch for you at the NFL level. So Mm -hmm. I think that this is um, something that he can use as a recruiting tool for sure. And it's something that even going back to this past offseason that Kenny Dillingham talked about with Jaden Rashada, he kept in touch with Jaden Rashada, said that he cared about him Mm -hmm. as a person. And what do you know? Jaden Rashada's uh, whole Florida thing didn't work out, and he ends up here at Arizona State. Yeah. So I mean, listen, it, that's not necessarily that's not going to happen with Jordan Clark here. He's going to Notre Dame. Yeah. But with situations like that, you can tell Kelly, Kenny Dillingham truly cares, which I think is one of the greater attributes that a college head coach can have. Obviously, there's the job on the field, but about. What, 75% of your job is making sure that you actually have players that will take the field for you? And the only way you can do that is if you recruit well. And that actually ties into some news that we saw this morning, which is Rashad Samples, uh, one of a couple of coaches that are going to be retained along with Kenny Dillingham and Brian Ward. So there's a foundation that is being built now, and it starts with recruiting. So... Also, a couple other transfers that we got to get to. BJ Green is in the portal, as well as Isaiah Glass. Yeah, um, with the Glass move, um, it sucks because they're losing offensive line. Yeah, and they need to get offensive line. But I kind of trust Kenny Dillingham to, you know, realize that that was the biggest uh, hole in on the team this season, and to go out in the transfer portal and to recruit hard at the high school level to get in guys that can compete for a starting role right away. Mm-hmm. And BJ Green is an absolute monster. He entered the transfer portal last year, decided to come back. So if I was Kenny Dillingham, I mean he's he's the best pass rusher on this team. Um, I would be heavily trying right now to re-recruit BJ Green and get him back here because as of, as of now he hasn't um, decided he is going anywhere else. So um, yeah, I, they've got to try to get BJ Green back here just because he is that that good. I was gonna say I think the only one that we've seen full commit and correct me if I'm wrong is that Jordan Clark is going to Notre Dame, and yes. I think that's the only one I've seen and. Again, there's been a slew of guys that have left. We mentioned Conyers, mentioned Green, mentioned Glass. Javen Jacobs was someone that entered the portal recently as well. Like, it's not just one guy. There's a massive amount of this roster that is looking for a new opportunity and a new chance this upcoming season. Now the cool things. Jason Brown has uh, committed to play at Arizona State. Awesome get. In 2024. He's a four-star recruit, uh, number... 160th overall in the ESPN Top 300. Um, ASU continues to not only get the running back correct at a, at, at this school, mm-hmm. so or they do continue to get everything correct at the running back position. So hopefully Brown can be just that second back or third back when it comes to you know, sitting behind Scadaboo for a year and then taking over the reins the year after, Mitch. Well, it's funny, too, because I was having a conversation with some of um, some of my other friends last night, 
And you have other friends? Yeah, I know. It's weird. <laughs> One of them pointed out that man, wait, there's wait, been, we're friends. <laughs> it's, there's been That's a streak. The there's been a streak of good running backs at this university, not just like coming into the university, but then what they also do on the field, dating as far back as I can remember to like Marion Grice. <laughs> And then That's that crazy. led to DJ Foster and Demario Richard, Kalen Balaj, Rashad White, who's doing awesome things at the NFL level right now. And then this past year with Camp Scadaboo and DeCarlos Brooks, like the X running back, for, X yeah, well. X, yeah. to be able to get him out of Wyoming. Like this has been a continual room that has seen the best production in a consistency in consistent years. Yeah, and with all due respect to Camp Scadaboo, um, he. Definitely did not, especially coming out of high school, have the talent that this Brown kid has. So, you know, maybe they, they split carries. Maybe DeCarlos Brooks is in that mix as well. But, like, I could see Brown coming in here and being the starter day one and being a really good back. I mean, four-star recruit, 160 in the 300. That's, like, there are a lot of high school football players. So if you think that's kind of low. Yeah. That is not low. That is an extremely high recruit for Arizona State. He's the number two, I believe, positional running back, according to 24-7 Sports, in the state of Washington. So just overall, like, this is a huge get for Arizona State. I think he's the number eight running back overall on ESPN's top 300 yes, as well. Yes, yes. Like, this is huge. He might come in here and immediately make an impact and he's already got the size at 510 195 so i mean like i would expect this guy to be to be a major impact player right away and maybe even you know take the starting role from some of the guys that are already here he could kind of start off as the and another name i forgot to mention he could be the eno benjamin behind demario richard That's and right. kalen balage from a couple of years ago sure and just they have a three-headed monster at back and all of them are good like kalen balage had a what was it an eight touchdown game mm-hmm. once and demario richard was the against lead back, was supposed to be against, the lead back in was it game. against patrick mahomes it might have been I believe it was against patrick mahomes <laughs> maybe cliff against kingsbury cliff kingsbury too <laughs> Eight touchdowns. Interesting. Good times. Do you see the quote from uh, Jason Brown as to part of why he chose ASU, by the way? I would love to hear it if you have it. I don't have it up. Um, but Give he, me a synopsis. He mentioned how much the journalism school at Arizona State was a big factor and hmm. part of him coming here, too. Love His that. education being super important. Nice. So he'll be a big, journalism student. Big fan of Cronkite. We'll get him. Uh, we'll try to get him on the show. Get him some Cronkite swag. Is that a promise? Is that allowed? Or? Is that allowed? I said we'll we'll try to get him on the show. It is a promise that we will try <laughs> to get him on the show. Good. Um, all right. So we've talked a lot about NIL on this show before, guys. Mm-hmm. Um, and there have been some developments happening in the Sun Angel Collective. Uh, Sun Angel Collective secures $1 million in uh, commitments for a fund to a fund that is something called the million dollar match do you guys they're, have se- like they're setting up a match so from now yeah. until the spring game um in march or april whenever it is from now until the spring game every donation will be matched dollar to dollar dollar for dollar up to one million dollars essentially is what they're setting up so they've secured the funds to execute the match is what the announcement says and now it's everybody that donates you're matched dollar for dollar up to a million dollars, which is just another way to super boost this collective and help these students get more money. Basically, thank you for explaining that because I was very confused. And as it took a lot me a of few people, times to read through, a yeah. lot <laughs> of people were very confused because they sent out a kind of like a I don't know how to put it, like a second statement on like how it works. So I, yeah. I'm I'm pretty excited about this. This is a step in the right direction, Jesse. Yeah, you've got to be involved in IEL. This is a uh, great way to get more money into nil shout out to the boosters who are doing this um and i'm excited to see what this does here's the thing so far that i've been happy with overall i think that that it might mean that nil is doing a little bit better we've seen a few guys enter the portal it's not been a mass exodus so far true which has been great to see could still be a mass exodus we're only about three days into the portal, so who knows? But so far, 
it's been good. And this, you know, player seeing this might mean, hey, I want to stick around here. Because uprooting your entire life is not exactly fun. Um, Jesse, explain explain what uprooting your life has done. Because I, just like talk about it to to the fans. Like if people have stayed here in Arizona their entire life, they don't understand what it's like to move away from their families, possibly. Yeah. Um, like I, mean, I, I know, like a few of us, all three of us have have moved away from our families to uh-huh. come and live in Arizona. Yeah. I mean, it's just like it's expensive to uproot your entire life. Like. You have to. You got to bring a suitcase full of clothes. You got to, like, yeah. some, some of your furniture, maybe. Like, yeah. it's not. It's not easy. But you, also, you can't just drive fifteen minutes to your family's <laughs> nope. place and, you know, go, and visit. Like, it's gonna be a couple hundred or more dollars to fly home to see your family if you're from, you know, a few states over or all the way across the country. Like. Jeremy and I are, um, and then just even like moving in general, like I've moved from apartment to apartment yeah. <laughs> and, um, just packing up and go like, it's, it's probably not good for your football career because instead of thinking about football, you're thinking about, do I have enough cardboard boxes to move my uh, to move my stuff where, which, you know, liquor store can I go to and get cardboard boxes to fill up? <laughs> you know, you've always got to do that because like they'll always have cardboard boxes to give to you. So it's just, it's, it's a process. And I'm sure these guys don't want to have to do that and love living here. And if they can get the money to stay here, why go somewhere else? Mitch, I also, something that people don't think about it and i'm trying to humanize these kids because some people yeah. will just think about you know oh they're leaving us that and this and that there's a lot that goes into making these decisions and also you're gonna you know that playing football means that you're probably going to play on thanksgiving weekend you're probably not going to be able to go home to see your family on mm-hmm. thanksgiving weekend especially if you come to arizona state either the day after thanksgiving or two days after thanksgiving you will be playing against u of a also if you make it to a bowl game, you don't get to spend December with your family. You probably will miss out on Christmas yes. or New Year's at the bare minimum as a result of success, basically. Like the top, the top six teams every year don't get to celebrate the new year with their family. They celebrate it with their teammates. Now, maybe that's not the worst thing in the world in comparison to some people having to miss Christmas or right around Christmas or Hanukkah. You know, both but of it's us a, are Jewish. It's a big commitment is what I'm trying to say. Yes, exactly. Uh, new Year's is overrated. Oh, get over you it. Didn't get over to, yourself. You didn't need to. I did. It's just, it, it's just moving from a day to another day. Who cares? It mean, it, but it's celebrating that you've moved 365 days. Yeah. Like, yeah, great. You, you've uh, moved past those 365 days, and you're going on to the next okay, 365 cool. days. Okay, cool. Like, the you, world is another year older, Jesse. Okay, great. Like, you explained right there why it's super <laughs> overrated. Also, guys, uh, ASU hired Marcus Arroyo as their new offensive coordinator and QB's coach, Mitch. It's the, it looks like they're solidifying this uh, coaching staff for the upcoming season. Of course, we mentioned the uh, retention of Rashad Samples um, as well as Brian Ward. And now they've got a guy who's going to be Kenny Dillingham's number one on offense. Yeah, he was 7-23 and as the UNLV head coach, which is not great. But at Oregon, he did coach Justin Herbert. So I'm excited about what he can do potentially with Jaden Rashada. Yeah, I think it's going to be a good hire for ASU, working hand-in-hand hand with Kenny Dillingham. We'll see how you know that goes and, and who's going to take the play-calling duty. I would like for it to be Kenny Dillingham, but also for him to have to be able to take some off of Kenny Dillingham's plate, I think that'll be good for the coming up season. And hopefully you know, getting him in here quickly will help with recruiting as well. So I have a lot to say about this topic that we're about to talk about, guys. Oh. College football playoff, Oh, the committee... They just chose the four teams that are going to play in the college football playoff. I'm upset not only because I have a rooting interest in what just happened because my mom went to Florida State. um, And I've been a fan of theirs my entire life. But I'm also upset because those kids 
played really hard this entire season and are not going to be able to play for a national title. The last time an undefeated Power 5 school did not make it into the college football playoff or the BCS national title game was in 2006 when Auburn was left out. Jason Campbell, shout out. And that (laughs) is when they decided, you know, maybe the BCS isn't the best way to do things. They moved to the college football playoff a couple years, four years, five years after, right? Yeah. They started to transition towards that. 2014 was, I think, the first year that they did it. Yes. Okay. Eight years. <laughs> How to so do that? Look, but the, the, the point there being... plans, like, they were working on something. But the yeah. point is, this is the first time it's happened since 2006. And the fact that this was essentially decided by the man that was under center for the full season. And you guys, you guys, I'm sure, saw what Jordan Travis tweeted out afterwards. Yeah, that's after so the announcement. sad. Uh, yeah, him, awful. his Does not deserve that. His defense of like giving Florida State a chance. I wish I'd have broken my legs sooner. That's awful. Like, yeah. the fact that this team did not get an opportunity. The fact that uh, former Sun Devil coach Mike Norvell doesn't get an opportunity to prove how truly good this team is because their defense was just as good as what their offense was able to do with Travis Healthy. And they essentially got robbed of that opportunity. This is the first time they've been in the conversation for something like this since 2015, I want to say. Since Jameis, since 20, Jameis Winston had them undefeated for like 25 games. So in 2014, they went to the college football playoff in the first co- college football playoff. They played against Oregon. Oregon beat them. I, you know, whatever, fine. But since then, it's been all Clemson that's dominated this conference. Yep. If this is Clemson, they make the playoff. Because of pedigree. Yes. I I don't know how they do it because they need to have an SEC team, it seems like. I think they would have Texas probably out. That's what I think would have happened. I think they would have put Bama in and te- taking Texas out if it were Clemson. The fact that it's Florida State and the fact that people didn't watch this team seemingly the entire year, <laughs> it blows my mind because this team was not all Jordan Travis. The defense had to win them multiple games this season because Jordan Travis or someone was dropping a pass. It wasn't just him playing fantastic the entire season and, oh, he's carrying this team. No, they have a wonderful running back. Like, there's just so many teams that... There, there's just so many ways that this team showed that it deserved to be in the playoff this year. It's mind-blowing that they were kept out. Here's my biggest takeaway is if Alabama is in this playoff, which they are, why do we play the games? Because if we're just going to take the best four teams on paper, why don't they just decide the best four teams at the beginning of the season and then just play a playoff and call, call it a day on the college football season? Because... Alabama did not have the season that Florida State did. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. So they shouldn't have made it. This they is almost clear. lost to Auburn, who lost to yes, New Mexico yes. State. They needed a what fourth and thirty-one completion to to beat uh, Auburn in that game. So um, yeah, ri- ridiculous. Um, Go Aggies. And <laughs> r- ridiculous though. It, and it, it they should have. Florida State should have gotten in. Uh, undefeated conference champion. I think Washington's the best team in the country. This, this, I think they should be ranked number one. This show, and I think they should be playing in the Rose Bowl. Why are they not playing in the Rose Bowl? <laughs> I mean, Pac-12 did it to themselves. Uh, also true. But, yeah, again, um, committee clearly showed their SEC bias. At the end of the day, this doesn't really matter fully because next year it's finally going to be fixed. Finally, because even the college football playoff with the four teams didn't fix a thing. No, nope. the problem was still there. That we we've had a ridiculous system for years where uh, this is like the most ridiculous thing is that the AP voters just used to decide the champion, and that was for years. And then they were like, "Okay, we'll have two teams play for national championship." But, and then teams would just claim national championships. They, UCF wasn't the first team to do that. Teams yeah. have been doing that for centuries. So yeah, uh, I expect. <laughs> no, I expe- I'm, I'm serious. Centuries. People yeah. have been doing that since the 1800s. I expect. <laughs> I expect Florida State to do the same if they beat Georgia, um, and they should. And they'll have beat the reigning champs in that process as well. Yeah, exactly. And so... Um, I, I don't know if you guys can tell. I'm fuming. Like yeah, the, the, I can The smoke I can tell. is coming out no, of the I can, I can tell. tell. And then I, I did want to make one more point. Um, 
that's non college football playoff related. Um, ridiculous that Liberty <laughs> is in the Fiesta Bowl. <laughs> I mean, they're undefeated. That they is had the, true. They had the worst strength of schedule. The worst strength of schedule. <laughs> and I feel bad for the people over there at the Fiesta Bowl, our good friends over there who don't decide this. Um, I, I bet you they wanted Arizona. I bet you they wanted Arizona <laughs> or Oregon or literally anybody they have else. Oregon. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. They have Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> um, literally anybody, any like Oklahoma else. State. <laughs> um, and yet. Yeah, Undefeated Oklahoma. Team, undefeated teams should get the opportunity to um, compete. You know, put at, them in the Alamo the Bowl. Highest, put the them highest. in the Alamo Bowl. Take one of Arizona and Oklahoma and put them in the Fiesta Bowl. I I agree, <laughs> but but that, like there's a, there's an extent where there's a line, and Liberty has had the worst strength of schedule. Florida State, Power Five Conference champion, Liberty, worst strength of schedule in the entire country. So. Yeah, they don't deserve to be in a New Year's Six. Uh, SMU probably could have gotten in a New Year's Six as well if you're going to go group of five. Um, so, yeah, uh, not not happy about that. I feel for our friends over at the Fiesta Bowl. Our friends, yeah. Um, and then last thing about the college football playoff, I was talking to our friend and colleague Jeff Munn about this. The criteria was never this. It was never if your quarterback gets hurt, you don't get into the college football playoff. It was never an SEC teams needs needs to be in. It oh, was never this. Ohio State won a national championship with their third string quarterback. But it's also never been the best four teams on paper. Of course. Nope. And Jesse, you brought up that point. Cincinnati earlier. got in. <laughs> Cincinnati. TCU. Desmond Ritter. All right. I've personally had enough talking about this. Can we talk about a true? NCAA deserving team yes. right now. Sweet 16. Hell yes, brother. Kill queen. Killer queen. She's got 34 My kills queen. in the first two games of this. Like, that is absurd. 17 in each of the first two games. 34. Like, and uh, Sun Devils have not lost a set yet. What is Guys, with them? And so they started off the regular season... Um, not or or they they, they surrendered like off. one set in the first ten games. Yeah, something matches. like that. Yes, something matches. Like that. They start off the regular season with a very long streak of not um, surrendering very many sets, and now they go through their first weekend of the NCAA tournament, zero sets allowed. So I don't know what's going on here, uh, but. Literally, this is insane. J.J. Vaniel came in to this program first year. This is the best team they've ever had. Literally the furthest they've ever gone in one season. It's insane. Fantastic hire by Ray Anderson. Yeah. By, by the <laughs> way, let's just clarify. We're talking about the women's volleyball team since I, I think we forgot to mention that off the top of this segment. But that We said kills and matches. And I yeah, think. but not everybody knows what that means. Like, yeah. If somebody just casually tunes into a pod and hears she has 34 kills, what is your first reaction? Is it volleyball or yeah, is it Call yeah, of Duty? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or do they think they're listening to a true crime podcast? But no, Call of Duty. This weekend's huge, right? Stanford, the number one team in their at, region. At Stanford. Where they've won before this season. They've won against Stanford. They, they beat Oregon on the road, and they've won at Stanford. They beat Stanford home. Okay. Yeah. This is, th look, regardless, this is a tough matchup because the Pac-12 continues to be a juggernaut in terms of volleyball teams. And even on the outside of that, I know Texas is in the other part of their bracket, and they ain't no slow pokes either. And I think Oklahoma's no, the, the, the other team they're the facing, pokes right? The are Oklahoma State. Uh, it's, no, 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 no. Oh. Well, they're not slow pokes. <laughs> Um, the point being is that there's not really a lot of precedent set for this one because they got swept on the road when they played, and then when they hosted them, they swept them. So it's really kind of a toss-up as to what this matchup is actually going to produce tomorrow night. Yeah, tomorrow night at 9.30 p.m. on ESPNU. Tomorrow night meaning Thursday night. We're recording this Wednesday. 9.30 9.30, that's late. That's, that's super late. late. But that's that's, that's 11, prime time. That's 11.30 Prime time and Eastern. Uh, who knows what's on ESPNU <laughs> before this, but uh, stay tuned to the little ticker because you know it'll it'll probably be some other game that runs into this one, and then it's got to switch to another channel. It, it happens. I'm gonna go watch it at the airport because I gotta go Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway. <laughs> anyway. Casual. <laughs> anyway. Hanging out on the beach. Um. 
Shout out Las Olas. Stanford <laughs> played Houston in their last match. Mm-hmm. What was the what was the final? And yeah. they won in five sets. Ooh, Stanford so made them work. ASU, ASU is the hot team coming into this, and I think it's cool because it is at least they could they could potentially still meet up with Oregon, but it might be the last ever ASU Pac-12 matchup. Um, you know, while the two teams are still in the Pac-12, so um, it's huge. It's awesome. I think ASU is going to win because again, they're the hot team coming in. I'll say this um, just to be like super duper nitpicky. If I guess there's something to watch out for, uh, particularly against BYU, and I think it was in that second set, they had you know two or three points to go in that set. And BYU just kept scoring and scoring and scoring to the point that they got it to like eight straight um, games won within that set. And Stanford's not going to be the team that's going to just kind of like keel over, per se. So if ASU wants to make sure that they get past this Cardinal team, they have to get the points. And they have to get those games won. Because Stanford is going to make you regret it if you let them hang around in each set. ASU is 28 and 6 on the season. This is the third time in the program's history that they've made it to the Sweet 16 and Sweet 16 and the first time since 1995. That was when I was born for the record. Wow. Yeah. I, I just it's been a minute. <laughs> so, I, Jesse, I think you're right. This is probably their best team they've ever had. Mhm. Yeah. Um so please tune into that match. 9.30 Mountain Time, 8.30 Pacific Time, 11.30 Eastern Time on ESPNU. And just for safekeeping, 10.30 Central. 10 Central. Gosh darn it. We had the same idea. ESPNU. <laughs> you can find it on the, 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 the television channel. The U. The thing. The U. Uh, sometimes can be the Ocho. Oh, yeah. Man. Sometimes the ESPNU changes just, uh, to the Ocho. Sometimes the Deuce changes to the, o- the Ocho now, too. The, the Ocho's really caught on. Men's hoops be hooping? Is that is that what you wrote? That's on how the I show? phrased it. They've yeah. got three straight wins, and they're very strong defensive wins as opposed to offensive wins. Granted, they put up their highest point totals of the season, I believe, in these three games, and Jose Perez has become an absolute offensive stud. I told you guys. Um, he and was one of the only people uh, freshmen in the country back in 2017, 2018, 2018 <laughs> to have a triple-double, had him tw- and R.J. Barrett. Had 24 points against Sam Houston, almost, almost had a double-double in that game because he had um, eight rebounds. Uh, you, he fills up the stat sheet, man. Well, so here's the other Most thing. underrated player on this team. Here's the thing that I wanted I to point. I don't know if he's point. underrated anymore. Huh? This is he what I... under the radar. <laughs> Nah, yeah, because he transferred two weeks before the season. Here's what I wanted to point out as far as what has led to their success, because as we know, they've been without Sean Phillips for the last week plus two weeks. They didn't have Zane Meeks a couple of nights ago, and I don't believe they had him uh, in their most recent contest against San Francisco. But they're getting rebounds primarily from their guards. Jemiah Neal had 11 rebounds against San Francisco. Frankie had eight. And then the other night against Sam Houston, they combined for like 27 of the team's rebounds. The guys that are getting these defensive boards are very aggressive in the paint. And it's been a treat to watch, especially with a lack of height down low. Yeah, from what I've watched with this team, um, I covered the game against Sam Houston. This team is going to annoy the hell out of people watching them when they're yeah. in that half court offense and then annoy the hell out of opponents opponents when they're guarding them and running in transition. So I think they're going to be better than the 12 wins that I predicted just because defense wins championships. Offense sells tickets. Sure. But defense <laughs> wins championships. Um, and so I think that they're going to annoy a lot of the teams that they play this year. I don't know how many wins that leads to, but I think it's going to be more than 12 overall, and I've really liked what I've seen. Them beating San Francisco, huge, because that team has given them a ton of trouble over the last couple of years, especially last season, and it's going to be great. It, it, it's just great overall that they were able to beat them and beat them by double digits. So um, nice to see that, and I hope that... Uh, 
they can keep doing that. And that's going to be a quad something win, <laughs> which is all of quad something. A- everyone we is love a quad quads. So- everyone is a quad something win, actually. <laughs> um, Mitch, and to your point about, you know, Phillips being out, mm-hmm. people have had to step up. And two of their guards, Neil and Collins, stepped up in the rebounding department. Against San Francisco, and, 11 rebounds for Neal and 8 rebounds for Collins. And the other thing, too, is that they're also producing a lot of turnovers in the uh, in the half court when their opponents are trying to set up the offense. Like, Jesse, I can't remember the exact number it was, but you and I were watching against Sam Houston. It was almost like a steal on every possession at one point in the second half. It just felt like possession after possession, ASU was finding their way to like force a turnover. turnovers that the Suns had yesterday? No, we don't need to talk about them. But I wonder how much this defense is going to translate because this SMU team, at least statistically, also has a pretty solid defense. That it's a. I was looking it up last night because I know ASU's defense has been good and they're like 67th and SMU's 22nd, I think it is. But the separation between the two in points allowed is like three to two points a game. It's not a ton of separation. Also, shout out uh, Rob Edwards, former ASU yeah. guard. He is now on the staff at uh, SMU as an assistant coach. Nice. Uh, it'll be nice to see him. He made it to the league, <laughs> um, played there. played a couple games for the Thunder, and now he's in coaching. So um, really cool for him. Good for him, yeah. Um, yeah, so that game is tonight at 8 p.m. at DFA on 98.7 and the Arizona Sports app. ASU is undefeated at home this season, 4-0. Dane Meeks out, according to John Rothstein. Which, I, that? which, you know, he's been out the last couple of games. So, yeah, they lose some height again. But what they've shown us is that they can produce without the height in the areas that matter. Um, yeah. And uh, just hopefully, you know, after tonight, if they do get that win against F- SMU, they have to play against San Diego on Saturday night at 8.30 on 98.7 FM and the Arizona Sports app as well. And that'll hopefully be a road contest, get, too. Yeah, so hopefully they are able to get these two wins before they go into next week. I think is next week the uh, the game at uh, Footprint Center? I think the Colangelo Classic yeah. is a 20. couple of weeks, but they have TCU, I think, in a week. TCU, yep. TCU is next week, which is a tough Ooh, one. Ooh, baby. Uh, Rematch Grudge match. Got to go 3-0 and in the revenge games. That's what they got to do. That's yeah. all I care about. Yeah. 3-0 <laughs> and in the revenge games. Yeah, so so SMU is 6-3 and this season. San Diego is also 6-3. and And then they play a 7-0 and TCU team in a couple, in uh, seven days from now. Big 12 preview matchup, rematch of the tournament. Or seven days from Saturday. That's the one that I'm That's for. That's going to be a rival. I'm, I'm calling it now. That's going to be a rivalry next year. Yeah. Those and, two. And I'm also looking forward to the... Um, game against Northwestern because Northwestern is good. They just beat, uh, even though Purdue is overrated. Over, even though Purdue is overrated <laughs> and Zach Eady is not good. Uh, <sighs> they, um, I mean, he's better than me, but he's not good. Uh, all right, let's let's quickly for college basketball. But I'm excited for that Northwestern. All game. right, let's quickly get through these final two topics. Uh, women's hoops. Uh, they had to cancel their game against Xavier. Um, they yeah. didn't really have a roster. It was Xavier that didn't have the roster this yeah. time around, so yeah. take that. But uh-huh. real a bum- really a bummer, because that's the Brianne January Classic, mm-hmm. yeah. and Xavier, I don't know if they were able to play their first game, but... You they know. were. They, uh, according to Doug Tamaro on Twitter, they suffered some unfortunate injuries on Friday. Yeah. Weren't able to play on Saturday. <laughs> uh, but on in Friday's women's hoops game, uh, they got a big win, and uh, Jaden Simmons... Had a career high twenty six, so she's done exactly what we've wanted her to do, which was hey, we can predict something correctly this year, guys. Yeah, we can predict. Unlike we've college got, football playoff, we've, we've got Jaden Simmons becoming the team's like focal point, and then Treasure Hunt has been uh, shooting for gold or some Boo. sort of stupid mm. pun. Sorry, Boo. Treasure, you deserve better than my stu- stupid. Puns. Hockey went one zero and one against Colorado College, but you know, of course, they had that shootout victory, so I'm I'm counting it as two and zero. It's you know, <laughs> in in the stat sheet, it'll go as a tie, but like the shootout is what matters. Yeah. Also, can we can we shout can we shout out a uh, goaltender T.J. Semptonfelter, who's got Good three job. he's got three shutouts this year, which is tied for the most in the league, and wow, he's got eight in his career, which is as many as Joey Dacord had with ASU. Wow, so he's dude's balling right now. The NHL, I'm gonna say he's on his way. Is he balling or pucking? I don't know, but he had a. Th- it was a thirty-eight save shutout against Colorado Standing on College his head. last week. There you go. Standing on his head, he's got it. 
Sempton Felter. Sempton Felter, I That's think. That's really good, Mitch. Good job. 12th in the rank. I'll, I'll check with Tyler Paley and Alex Coyle on that one because they'll know. A ho- they host Dartmouth Friday and Saturday at Mullet Arena. Make sure to head out and support the college ho- hockey team here at Arizona State. It's a fun name. Dartmouth. Um, Ivy League. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, but the, the support for the hockey team has been fantastic this year. I'm sure it'll be fantastic again this weekend. They're staying pat at 12th in the rankings right now. So, it's pretty good. Looking like they're going to make the tournament this year, which is what we've wanted to be the first time since 2019, I want to say, that they will make 2020. 2020. And there again, they've had wins against Providence. They've had wins a win against Denver. It's not like they're getting cheapies on the schedule. Nope. Like Within those 11 wins are some really good top-of-the-league wins. And so they deserve to be in that field when the time comes. Anyway, guys. That's going to do it for this edition of State of the Sun Devils. Thank you so much for listening and watching on our YouTube channel. You can follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, Facebook, and Threads. Threads? Who? At AZ Sports Devils is where you can find us on every single one of those platforms. You can also check out the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And every article that you'll ever need is at ArizonaSports.com. If you follow Arizona Sports and the Arizona Sports app. You will find everything you're looking for. It's a free app, by the yeah. way. Oh, it's so free. download it. It's free. free. It's free, baby. Um, <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for listening. For my good friends, Mitch Varelis and Jesse Morrison. Good. I'm Jeremy Schnell. We'll talk to you in a little bit.